In a different video, I had a look at light curves, what they were and how you acquired them. Well, in this video, we're going to have a look at astrometry, which is actually quite similar. So the method in which you would acquire the data is quite similar to doing a light curve. But this time around, we're not interested in the brightness of the object over time. We're interested in the very precise position of that object in time instead. So it's kind of its movement and its position against background stars instead of how bright it is. But they complement one another and typically they're done together anyway. So it's fairly obvious here that not all objects are stationary with regard to the background stars. Some objects move quite fast, some of them fairly slow, some of them move for various different reasons. But Bernard star here is a relatively fast moving star nearby. And you can see it's moving quite quickly with regards to the background stars, which appear to be stationary. Now, if we were to take a measurement of that, take lots of different images, get its precise position, and then create a plot of that, we can start to understand how it's moving. Because here, it looks like it's going in a straight line. But maybe there's more going off that we can learn about the object from getting its precise movement over time. So how do you start? Well, it's kind of similar to doing a light curve. You take a single image. And then you would use reference or standard stars as a starting point to find the position of your star that's being measured. I say star, you can do it for another object. It could be a asteroid, for example, or a comet. Now, these reference stars, you'd ideally want them to be close to your object that you are measuring. The closer they are, the more accurate your your position is going to be that you, you calculate. You don't want them in a different image. If you get them in the same image, that's obviously going to be better. And you don't want to be too bright either, because if they're too bright, you're going to be overexposed when you're taking your particular image. Now, here I've noted out some stars as reference stars. This is just purely um, to show you these aren't actual reference stars, but they would be in a standard catalog. They would be very well understood. They have a very, very precise um, position there. So you take your single image, you then calculate a position off the reference ones, and you make a note of that. Now, the objects are going to have a position or a coordinate on the celestial sphere. So the celestial sphere is made up of two components. So you've got the right ascension and the declination. So the declination is from plus 90 degrees to minus 90 degrees. So you look kind of looking like the latitude on Earth, looking outwards. And the right ascension is basically 360 degree around, but the actual units are in hours. So it's between naught and 24 hours. And you typically see that the uh, position will be in hours, minutes, seconds, whereas declination would be kind of in degrees. But they are basically still a, a degree, or an angle, I should say. So you may have seen like star charts like this. So this is the Orion constellation with stars, the nebula and things like that on. But you can see it's set out in declination and right ascension. Now, those coordinates don't change regardless of how they appear in the sky. So as you are, well, as the Earth is rotating, the celestial sphere stays stationary, but the Earth rotates inside it. So the stars are not moving in their own coordinate system. They are stationary in the coordinate system. It's just Earth that rotates inside them, So, which is worth noting out if you were aware of that. And you've got a nice image there, actually, of the star trails created. If you take an image over time and then you stack them, you can see how the stars actually rotate around the pole. So what you want to do, you take multiple images at different times. And then you can get the movement. So it's as simple as that, although it's not that simple. It's a lot more time consuming. and There's a lot of calibration to do. But this is Bernard's star. And again, it's a fast moving star. And you can see it's moving quite fast with the background stars. So you're going to take multiple images and then you can create a plot if you have an RA and declination coordinate for that particular object. And each time you do that, you have a different mark on your plot given here. And what that will do is it should show a proper motion. And that proper motion is the general direction that object is moving, but it's also a angular motion because RA and declination are angles. So the proper motion is actually a angular motion. So you get a like an angular velocity that's moving in the sky. And the closer it is, obviously, the faster it's going to, or the, the greater that proper motion is going to appear. And it's also worth noting that you get a parallax effect from Earth's orbit. 
So as the Earth goes around the Sun, it's on one side of its orbit and then the other, and that obviously causes a parallax angle as well, which you get happening perpendicular to maybe what was happening with this proper motion here. So that particular movement there is from the parallax of Earth's orbit. The proper motion is in the other direction, and if we didn't, if the Earth wasn't orbiting, it, you'd get probably more of a straighter line there. Now we can compensate for that and remove it out. So if you actually know what the parallax effect is going to be, you know what the proper motion is, and you remove that out, you essentially flatten it out, you can look for any residual left behind, which is not accounted for, and that could give you an orbit. So here you've got a star that appears to have an orbit when all the other stuff's compensated for and taken out. And it could show a unseen companion. So it could be that it's orbiting an object that we can't see. So it could be a, a dense quite a dim object, so maybe a neutron star, a white dwarf, maybe even a planet actually. We could have an unseen planet, and some exoplanets have been discovered using this method, because you've got another object there that they are orbiting a common centre of mass. We can detect it by looking at the position over time using our astrometry. And it's actually how most asteroids are discovered, and how their orbits are then determined. So what you would do is you'd take an image, take another image, and then you kind of compare, is there any object moving in that frame? And asteroids typically move quite fast, so you don't need a huge amount of time between frames to start to see something moving across. Now, if you've done anything like astrophotography, and your image, you're interested in imaging things like a nebula that takes a very long time to image, you're probably going to end up having asteroids wandering across at some point. So this is how they're mostly detected, really. And the closer that asteroid is to us, then the faster that proper motion. The further away they are, then they, they appear quite slow. But it gets quite difficult to do astrometry and even a, a light curve of an asteroid when they're quite close because they're moving so fast that your reference stars have to change each time. And that gives you additional errors and can make it quite problematic. So thank you for watching. And if you enjoy, then please check out some of the other videos.